So we are here at Punk Globe Magazine. My name is Gabriel Johns, and I have a really special guest here today, Geza X. He's been around for quite some time. Um, he has a lot of things on his uh, on his um, background, his things he's done, music he's created, people he associated with, and I think we got some nice surprises from him today. So um, we're just waiting for him to come on right now. And um, I feel very fortunate that I get to speak with him today. And um, I met Geza quite some time ago, a long time ago, when he's with, I think, the Mommy Men. Used to listen to him on Cake So Youth. Cake So used to play him a lot. And, um, and he's worked with Rodney on The Rock, Rodney Bingenheimer. And I'm really happy to see that he should be coming on. So just bear with me. We're ready for him. Okay. Well. And let's say hello to Geza X. Welcome, Geza. Can you hear me okay? I think you're muted. If you could unmute yourself. Hi. Hey, Geza. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Great. Is that your little kitty there? Um, you see my picture here. Hold on a sec. I saw the kitty. Hi. There you are. Oh, you're at the beach. Nice. Very nice. Good day for it. Um, so I already gave you an introduction, um, but I want to hear what is Geza? Who is Geza X? Is he a musician, producer, or just an all-around icon to the great world of entertainment? I guess at this age, I'm a professional celebrity, but <laughs> really, I'm best known as a record producer. Yes. I'm someone who's been behind the scenes in the, you know, indie and um, grassroots underground music thing for like, you know, Jesus, like 45 years. Yeah, you, you are somewhat of an icon, if you ask me. Um, everyone knows who Geza X is, and if they don't, well, too bad. They should learn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Hey, I just want to start off with, um, I was speaking to Lauren, telling him that I was going to interview you. And he was like, oh my God, I just spoke with him um, regarding a new project he's working on. Can you tell us what this new project is? And he says, yeah, perfect. Thanks for asking. And Lauren's great. You know, his band, The Dogs, was very, very much of a vital part of what happened um, in the mid 70s before punk rock exploded in LA. They drove out here from Detroit and New York in a van. They lived in a, this big bread van on the beach and uh, started, started uh, like booking shows in these halls that were uh, in LA way before there was any uh, clubs open or anything like that. Maybe the Starwood was doing a few heavy metal bands like ACDC, I think had a residency there. But if it weren't for the dogs, a lot of the, the early shows that happened in halls that I would call sort of proto-punk would never have happened. And there might not have been a scene because uh, in the mid seventies, it's difficult to believe, but you know, there were no, there was not really any like live loud music, like with martial amps and stuff, especially really primitive music. It was like, it was like the era of disco or progressive rock, which was progressive rock, I guess you could say is like rock mute, merged with jazz, but you had to be like a virtuoso, like Jeff Beck or something or Mahavishnu to be able to actually, um, Santana, to be able to actually function in that environment. So, you know, most of us who were like a lot more primitive and didn't really have uh, the chops to, oh, excuse me, what happened here? You're still here. Oh. I still see you and I can hear you. Oh, here we go, <clears throat> jeez. Um, I was on two different screens there. That's weird. <laughs> um, yeah. Those of us who didn't have the chops to be able to play, you know, uh, spectacularly like that, we're kind of shit out of luck as musicians. And 
a lot of us have grown up with really kind of primitive, crude three chord music like the Seeds and the Standells, right. and uh, a lot of those like you know late '60s one hit wonders that ended up on the Nuggets compilations, which were fantastic. And uh, who did those? Len, uh, Len, Lenny, uh, forget who it was, but anyways, uh, um, those Nuggets compilations were absolutely. Uh, wonderful because they were the bands yes. that were like on the street and um and uh so those of us who grew up with that really longed for a return to sort of sort of like you might call three chord rock we started reading articles in uh bomb magazine written by greg shaw who famously i believe coined the term punk rock and was kind of doing a call to action and saying, you know, all these garage bands should get together and start a scene, you know, that like, you know, those days of punk rock from the late 60s. Should... Now, it, was, it was such an angst, wasn't there? Like just some, we needed to express ourselves. We needed to come out and say something and thank God they did. Yeah. And so the dogs were a really important part of, of the sort of, precursors to punk and uh we're working on this documentary series me and some other people i i uh i got tapped by a uh indie uh distributor called reality films to do basically a movie on the hollywood punk rock scene because hollywood punk here right in the shadow of the entertainment industry ironically uh, the scene that was emerging here never got any attention at all from the major labels, except for maybe like the Go-Go's and X. And even those started off on indie labels. Right. So, you know, it's, it's ironic that all of these other scenes like, you know, England and New York have had, you know, like, you know, huge amount of books and movies made about them. But right here in LA, we're, the Hollywood scene was just fantastic. You know, like about 1976, 1977, after the Ramones and the Sex Pistols kind of came out with their first records, LA exploded with punk. But LA is a, what you might call a Dada town. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the craziness of the entertainment world kind of creates a lot of satire. For those of us who live here, where we see how false all of that is and we make fun of it. So LA Punk had really strong Dada roots when it first started. And uh, in fact, Brandon, who started a club called The Mass, that wasn't even a club, it was like a bootleg. Right. The rehearsal place that uh, you know, was sort of like a bootleg club on the weekends, totally illegal. A lot of fights with the fire department and, you know, just crazy stuff would happen. I, uh, I saw that place kind of starting up. I said, hey, you know, do you have any rooms available for rent? And he found this one little room right by the stairs going down into the basement that was this catacombs of, like, rehearsal spaces. Just, you know, you never knew where it started or ended. It was the weirdest place in the world. Right. And... Uh, he rented me a room, and so I was able to uh, start helping out. I had a PA, I had a tape recorder, I had some microphones and stuff like that. So, you know, I became their house sound man. And as a result, I got to, like, uh, join a bunch of bands and play a lot of gigs, you know. It's like I was in the original bags when we actually wore bags on our heads. Right. And then I joined the Deadbeats, which was... It's one of the most amazing punk jazz Dada bands that really ever was. And so now we've gone back, you know, Don Bowles and I have gone back and started doing interviews and we did 40. Oh. Yeah. He's the drummer of the germs and he's a very talented guy. He helped write one of the books on LA punk and uh, continues to be, you know, quite an amazing person as a DJ and as a, uh, you know, he does these, amazing sort of sound montages and listens to really weird records and stuff. So I've always liked Don and uh, I asked him to 
post, you know, to do the narration and the interviews with wow. me. So we, we went around and interviewed like 40 different, more than 40 at this point, different people from the scene. We tried to make sure that we got a real cross section. It wasn't like, you know, like the, the bands that have gotten all the, the attention, like, you know, Go Go's X, uh, you know, uh, well, that's practically, oh, you know, Black Flag, you know. Um, they've had plenty of stuff written and told about them. So we decided to go to the originators, the, the people in the bands that started it, the people that like were doing the fanzines, the people that were taking photos the the uh, historians who were watching the whole thing and ended up writing books about it. Wow. And we interviewed like a really nice cross section of people for these uh, for the documentary. And it was just gonna be a movie, but then we ended up with so much material it's now like a twelve part series, kind of a Netflix style series. Ooh, ooh, nice. But more much more DIY. <laughs> yeah. You know, because we're not like a professional film crew and there was only a few of us doing was this. It, was it, would it be anything like the, the rise and fall of the Western civilization kind of thing happening? Well, the problem with that was that, you know, there was this magazine called Slash Magazine that was yeah. sort of like the mouthpiece of the uh, Hollywood punk scene. And it was a great magazine. We all wanted to be in it. We liked all the people that were running it. But Slash was very Slash-centric, and they sort of tried to dictate trends where the, the wider-ranging scene had a lot more elements of humor, and it wasn't just like three-chord uh, English punk. We, the Bags even had a song called We Don't Need the English, you know? Um, <laughs> right. Because, because once again, you know, with places like Burbank and Pasadena, here near Los Angeles, those are so kooky towns and they tend to create artists who are a lot more into like weird art and Dada and stuff like that. Like the LA Free Music Society comes out of, you know, Pasadena and they're, they're just as weird as it gets, you know? So a lot of us in the early scene were experimenting and weren't like really adhering to the English model. We liked it, and we had a lot of that in our music, like the Deadbeats was like sort of like power chord guitar. But then instead of having a second guitarist, we had a rhythm sax player. Wow. Who played, played through an octave divider. That was Pat Delaney. And Pat and I would play as if we were two guitars, but he, he was playing a sax with a pickup on it through an octave divider. So that was like, you know, a lot of muscle on the, on the root notes. <laughs> And then all of these jazzy sprinkles and weirdness that Scott and his brother, um, Sean, would bring into the mix. So, you know, bands like the Deadbeats were very much a part of the early scene, but later on kind of got pushed aside when the second wave came Ooh, along and all of the yeah. Huntington Beach bands and the skate punk bands, you know, all of which I, I love that sound too, but that was just one side of it. And it was really the second wave. So we tried to capture that period between 1972 and 1982. Kind of the that root. Was, that was the first wave of Hollywood punk. Right. Right. And sorry, I'm eating. No sorry, I'm eating. No, no worries at all. Um, when do you think this will be out? We're looking at... We're hoping to release the first six episodes around December or January. It's wonderful. And then, and then the second six will come out as another batch. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, do you have anybody picking you up to assist you, help you get this launched off the ground? Yeah, like I said, we do have a distributor. This thing started with a distributor, which was a, an indie distributor, but he's, uh, he's wild. Reality Films is a wild label. They do a lot of stuff with, like, you know, they do those Bigfoot things that you see on Netflix. They do UFO ghost wow. stories, uh -huh. conspiracy stories. But the uh, owner, Oren Croyle, who's an amazing man, he used to be an uh, audio engineer himself, he, uh, he started this thing because he wanted to do like some kind of 
off-label types of, of video distribution. And uh, then he decided to start a, a series called Inside Metal. And then he also decided to start a series called Inside Punk. And he tapped me to, to do the Inside Punk series. Nice. I love it. I so love we've been it. working on it for a while. It's been almost like, I'm embarrassed to say it's been almost 10 years. But it's in edit now and it's starting to look pretty darn good. You know, it takes what it takes to get something done. It's never, it's, it's the perfect timing. I always believe that it's the perfect timing. Can't be too soon, can't be too late. You know, it is what it is, to coin that idiot phrase. Um, but it, it'll happen when it's supposed to happen. And it sounds like it's going to happen any moment. They say that when you don't have a big budget, you have to really put a lot of time into it. And we also didn't have... Uh, as much expertise, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a photographer. I've had, you know, I printed up, you know, uh, a lot of my works on canvas. I do these kind of like altered photo photographs where I really doctored in a Photoshop and then I print them up big. Nice. I've had those, I've had those in galleries. So I, I have chops as a photographer, but I'd never made a movie per se. And that's been a learning process. Fortunately, I found a wonderful editor whose name is Dave Travis, and he was in the scene, so he knows everything really, really well. It's That's Abby, cool. Tra Abby Travis's brother. Abby she, Travis, wow, okay. Yeah, and she's played in a lot of different groups. Yes. So the two of them, you know, they've been in the scene since, like, the, the early days. Uh, Dave, the editor, he had Cafe Neela for a while. Okay. I remember that. Excellent. That's wonderful. Um, anything else you have to say about that? Anything else you want to relate to our uh, audience? Well, I started a label. I started a record company. Oh, let's talk about that. I started that a few years ago. And it, honestly, it's, it's taken like several tries. But this last year, I got it off the ground really nice. I, I'm kind of grateful that COVID happened because yeah. I was able to focus on this. And a lot of musicians were recording with their stimulus checks. And one of the gigs that I do on the side is I'm a mastering engineer and I master to this day, you know, stuff that's like, you know, grassroots, you know, uh, nice. stuff, you know, bands, bands that are basically um, pretty, pretty underground, but you know, that release singles and things like that. So I love doing that. I love always being like, you know, sort of like right on the, cusp before something is actually released so um i realized that this you know being a mastering engineer is a fantastic way to cherry pick good acts and good records that are about to come out so i started to uh you know decided to help out some bands because people have been asking me for years well you know okay i finished this record sometimes they paid me good good money to produce it or master it nice and then they asked me, gosh, you know, do you know any labels? And I always had to say no and say, you know, it's really hard to get a record out. And it's like kind of, you know, don't quit your day job. Right. So, so I started thinking, you know, man, there's like, you know, I'm an artist and there's all of these other artists and, you know, they're, they're just hurting for exposure and recognition. Nowadays with streaming, there's really not that much money in putting records out, but I have the exactly. uh, connections and sort of like the track record to be able to do it on a level where at least it could get, you know, these records could get seen. Um, I just heard your song Hot Rod on Rodney on the Rock this past Sunday. And um, is, is that a comp, a comp, comp um, on your label? It is, isn't it? We just released Rodney on the Rock, volume four. That's There's 18... There's 18 songs on it. It's out on everything, you know, like Apple Music and uh, uh, Amazon. And uh, we've got about four, four albums. Well, we've got four records out now, two, two albums, the Rodney album, and then I've got an album by an artist named Robbie Quine. I love Blue Robbie Quine. He's fantastic, right? Is he the one who did uh, Tab Hunter? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, I love Robbie. And that's great to hear. This album is called Glitter Hole because, you know, he's sort of like, <laughs> you know, David Bowie on a surfboard 
after joining the cramps is kind of what it sounds like, you know? Yeah, Cindy Kona really loves him. Yeah, really he's loves, fantastic. I really love him. He's just fantastic. Yeah. So uh, we released a full album uh, of his. You know, we spent some time picking the songs and making sure that they were produced right, but it's a fantastic sounding record. So that's our second album out. And then we have a couple of EPs. We've got a, a Latin ska act called Gabriela Penca that we did a four song EP with. And uh, they're hot, you know, it's like they really, really, uh, uh, they do fantastic when they do gigs, you know, with a big slam pit and uh, they're quite popular. And then uh, we put out an Americana act called Stomp Box Holiday. And that's a five song EP. Wow. So that's what we have so far, but I'm, you know, putting stuff in the hopper right now. There's a record called Lotteria, which was, uh, you know, 40 different West Coast artists who uh, got shuffled into like a hat and then uh, bands got put together at random out of the oh, shuffle. And uh, it's a lot of names like uh, Mike Watt and Paul Rossler and uh, wow. Heather, Heather Gallipo, all of these uh, people from the, you know, the scene here that got thrown together into like not their own band into different bands. And then during COVID, we sent the tracks around so people could add their own overdubs. Wow. And each, each band, so to speak, had um, a, a songwriter who was also the producer and the main guy or girl. And then other people would guest on their songs. So like my song had Heather Galipo on it. My song is called Kinky Bitch. And it's about, <laughs> it's about what we call disaster baiting, which is... Uh, watching the news and getting like all wound up over the bad news. That's hilarious. You know, you know when you get on YouTube and start looking at conspiracy theories, that's called disaster baiting. So this <laughs> song, Kinky Bitch, is about stop disaster baiting, turn off the, you know, devil computer screen and read your, you know, encyclopedia, <laughs> basically. So Heather Galipo performed on that. Mike Watt performed on that. And, uh, Bob Lee, one of the uh, people who started the project, who produced that project, the Lotteria Project, and they put it out on vinyl through Org Music, uh, which is a, quite a well-known vinyl label, and then uh, Gaza X Records is doing the digital release. Nice. So that's the, that's the newest thing that's going to be coming out. We're working on that right now. I've got a really good distributor. I'm fortunate that I uh, locked in with a, a distributor who uh, – is an actual like uh, distribution agent. It's it's he uses Orchard, which is Sony, and a number of other distribution channels. But the the good thing about it is that um, I can call him and ask him questions, and it's not like trying to talk to an anonymous black box, which is the problem with Orchard. You know, is that you can't get anybody on the phone, get any help. So this guy's name is Ed Gertler. And he has a company called DDS Distribution, and he's doing a fantastic job for us. He's a wonderful person. And then uh, we got a grant from a company called Airplay Direct. Airplaydirect.com is on the web, and it's free for DJs and program directors to sign up. It's also free for a band to sign up and just try their platform out with one release. So Airplay Direct has given us a lot of love, and I just wanted to give them a shout-out because they're doing a really good job for us. They're helping us promote to radio. They have, like, 12,000 radio stations who uh, go on there regularly, and what you do is you upload, like, a, you know, an EPK, a press kit, and uh, samples of the songs in high resolution, um, and the DJs can literally download it straight from their platform and play it on the air that night if they want to, wow. with all of with all of with all of your promo information and everything. How so long have you been around? Oh, they've been around a good long while. Right. But they what they they have a very strong foothold in, in blues, Americana, jazz, wow. um, and in international. They have DJs all over the world. So now we're trying to sort of uh, help them, you know widen their power base into the alternative rock world. And so I'm really urging bands to uh, sign up for, for their service um, because um, it's a really good way of making contact with radio stations. And as the uh, 
as the uh, DJ base in alternative grows, um, it's going to be more and more of a valuable tool to alternative bands. But nowadays, really, when you stop and think about it, just about everything is alternative because so many uh, bands are, are, are indie and doing their own uh, records. Right. So, the, you know, the, the, the genre varies, but the basic platform is, you know, nowadays it's all alternative except for the few major label exceptions. Right. Indeed. Um, who, I'm going to bring up Josie Cotton because you used to work with Josie Cotton and you mentioned Paul Rossler, you know, they're over at Kitten Robot. Um, you, do you still work with them or? We're still friends. You know, we all had a studio together. Josie and I started a studio called Satellite Park in Malibu and we ran that for like 13 years. Wow. It was beautiful. It was on four and a half acres. We all lived there. And I built a studio literally from the ground up to my own specifications. This came after uh, I did that, produced that song Bitch by Meredith Brooks, mm -hmm. which was, you know, a, a humongous hit, double platinum. And uh, the other reason I did that was because, you know, people were always calling me the punk producer and I wanted to show them that I'm doing punk alternative and indie as a lifestyle choice. It's because it's, it's the scene that I am part of, the scene that I want to be with and the type of music that I love because I like weird music and I like like uh, rowdy music but I got tired of being called the punk producer so I said okay I'm just gonna make a hit song and that was that song bitch by Meredith Brooks wow that's and accurate. after after it sold through so marvelously um, I had people kind of had their eye on me and that's how I got the funding to build a studio completely of, of my own design and uh, you know, I didn't do all of the architectural work. I had a couple of really good designers helping, but it was basically laid out the way that I wanted it to be. That's amazing. Uh, I got you know, to. I love your your love for this whole the whole scene. It, it's just it's just kind of like wow. You really you know. I've, I've been reading a lot of it. I've interviewed Michael Goldberg, who just did the book for um um um, um we'll see. James will see Jimmy and um, and another another book and it, it seems like all these bands from the East Coast to the West Coast have all met each other TSOL um, even D generation um, talked about so many so many people you, you you yourself or was in San Francisco now for a bit I spent so much time in San Francisco that people thought I lived there I was there uh, half half the time and very, very tight with the San Francisco bands like the Mutants and uh, Dead Kennedys. You know, I used to sleep on their floor when I went up there. Right. And uh, it, to this day, you know, um, I'm, I'm still, you know, somewhat involved. I just mastered um, uh, a Toiling Midgets record. And they were like a, a very well-known San Francisco band. Wow. And you are friends with Ginger Coyote. Ginger's a doll. I adore her. You know, I met her in San Francisco. Uh, you know, we used to hang out at the Mabuhay a lot. Yes. Um, you know, I, I spent many, many, many nights uh, hanging out with her. And, uh, you know, she's just a beautiful and very productive human being. Excellent. That's, that is so wonderful. We got like three minutes left. Um, anything you we want interviewed, to we interview? interviewed? Yeah, we interviewed Ginger for this documentary. Wow, great! You know, she she played a, a a strong role in in the history of it because, like I said, we wanted to get people who had fanzines, and that's one of the things she was doing back in those days. Yeah, the white trash debutantes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, she had what was the name of her fanzine in San Francisco? I forget what it was called, but anyways, um, might have been Punk Globe for that matter. Um, it could have been because it's all the way yeah. back from the 70s. I know. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let me see what else. I would say that that pretty much covers everything that's going on. And I really appreciate your uh, interview. Thanks very much for. Uh, okay. So, you know, every time I hear your name, I just get kind of a smile and go in it because it, it brings you back to work to, to, to then and to the now, because I see your name pop up all over, uh, Rodney on the Rock, you're, you're you know, just in, in, in reading different tabloids. It's just like, you're there, you're there. He was there. Gaze X is 
you know, you, you, you know, he knows what he's talking about. So I'm really looking forward to this. So the first three Rod, Rodney on the Rock albums came out on Posh Boy Records, and Posh Boy himself was kind enough to sort of pass the torch to me. You know, I remastered his entire catalog wow. um, last year, and it, it took a year because he's got a lot of records on his, his thing, and he was so gracious. He always gives me credit. And he was always, you know, so, so nice to work with. And then he passed this Rodney record on to me so I could get my label started properly. That was a big deal. Wow. And, uh, and so, you know, I want to give him a shout out. And I want to just explain that the reason that I am so in, deeply in love with the underground music scene is because I came up in the 60s, you know, when that was like a thing. And, you know, I, you know, I was listening to bands like the Jefferson Airplane and um, Quicksilver Messenger Service and seeing a lot of psychedelic music. And I fell in love with that scene, with the politics, with the art. There was so much vitality at that time. And as, as that scene kind of petered out, when punk rock started to come into focus, I was like, oh my God, you know, this might be another such moment. So, you know, I decided to record all of the bands that I could because I was afraid that the major labels would never touch this music, which is what turned out to have happened. So I had a really, really strong commitment to, to recording that kind of music because I felt like maybe it would never see the light of day otherwise. And that wow. is what happened. It says our remaining time is nine more minutes. Okay. I don't know what that means. I don't want to get cut, cut off because um, you have just so much interesting stuff to say. Um, yeah, they usually allow 45 minutes. And so that makes sense. We've been on for 31 minutes. And so. Okay. Good. But I think we've covered everything unless you have questions. Talk about Hot Rod? Talk about Hot Rod. Well, Hot Rod is a t song of teenage love and lust. <laughs> there we go. Nice. And it was, uh, it was kind of a tip, tip of the hat to the sort of like the uh, Frank Zappa doo-wop thing. You know, there was doo-wop, and then there was exactly. Frank Zappa making fun of doo-wop, and then there was me making fun of Frank Zappa making <laughs> fun of doo-wop in Hot Rod. But it's kind, of, it's kind of a crossover between like, you know, uh, you know, Americana, doo-wop, and, uh, and Psycho Billy, which, you know, I, I'm a fan of Psycho Billy. That's one of the reasons I love Robbie's music is right. you know, he's got Psycho Billy elements too. And, uh, you know, so check out the Rodney on the Rock. Check out my song on it, Hot Rod. Yes. Check out Lotteria when it comes out and my song on Lotteria, Kinky Bitch. And then, you know, check out the Robbie Quine album, which, like I said, is like David Bowie yeah, resurrected that. on a surfboard. Right. Joining the cramps. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. He, he, it's, he's just, I, I dig him. He's just, I love listening to him. I, I it's a great know. album. The cover, you got to see the cover. It's called Glitter Hole. And it's just got the most hot pink cover with him like on stage on a microphone. It's just absolutely wonderful. I've got to check Good it out. Record. Yeah. Hey, okay. I wanna, love you. Thank I, you. What up? I want to let you know, um, this is the 45th anniversary of... Punk Low, 45th anniversary issue. Oh, my God. So it, this, there's been 40, 45 issues of this. Um, or 45th anniversary issue. Anyway, this is a big deal for Punk Low magazine, and I'm really glad I'm part of it, that I get to talk to you. Um, um, I've always loved your work all the way back, you know, listening to KXLU, and God, they, they would play you forever. They just, uh, these two girls were just hilarious and they would just play Gaza action. Oh, I got a lot of love from KXLU. Did, yes. You know, it's interesting. Ginger's been at it exactly the same length of time as I have, you know, because basically, um, you know, I've been producing for 45 years and it's interesting that we got our start pretty much at the same time, you know, um, at the Mabuhe. I was just starting to produce, like, I, I got very fortunate to, like, I was able to produce the Dead Kennedys holiday in Cambodia, which, you know, exploded. Wow, yes. That's, that was with, um, 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 oh, God, who's a singer? Yeah, Jello. Jello, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that, that was a great hit there. That was a good. I used to sleep on Jello's floor, and he would tell me the most hilarious stories. He's a really good storyteller. Nice, nice. What else? Tell me something personal. What's your favorite food? 
What are you eating there? I'm, I'm eating tater tots and eggs. But my favorite person is my wife, Larva. She's a uh, fantastic artist, and she's worked with uh, you know people like Annie Leibovitz, and uh, as uh, you know, as a photo choreographer on Vanity Fair covers, and and then my favorite cat is Frankenstein, my little cat Frankenstein. Oh boy! Oh, and jo oh, you know, Larva just produced a, a Josie Cotton video. Uh, what call? What's it called? Elvis. Ballad of Elvis. Yeah, yeah, with uh, Kevin Preston. Exactly. Kevin Preston. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lar Great Larva, video. Larva, my wife, she produced that. Wow. Good, good job there, Larva. Um, that she was says thanks. Pretty good. Um, um, I, I love that. Um, I'm a big fan of Josie Cotton and, oh, and yeah. Kevin Preston with prima donnas, and um, you know, so much it seems coming up from this age of um, all that stuff that was so underground is just coming to the surface, rising to the surface. As I think like these were great bands. Nobody knew them back then. Oh, nobody really wanted to play them, touch them on on um, um, on a, um, a grand scale, a, 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 a hit level. There's a uh, very, very strong urban myth uh, that I was also instrumental in helping to create, but that, that says that these bands got blackballed. And that's one of the reasons they never saw the light of day. That's one of the reasons I'm trying to straighten out the history of this thing uh, by doing this documentary. Good. Because uh, I had heard that Reagan wrote a letter to the heads of all the record companies urging them not to sign this anarchy. They didn't want anarchy in the United States. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, the, 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 the best bands didn't get signed. The Screamers, the Weirdos. These bands should have been signed in a minute, in a hot minute, in a you know normal world. Yeah. And uh, none of us saw really any real success. You know, I didn't really get a chance until I did that song, "Bitch," because uh, people thought that what I was doing was too underground. I love the underground music, and I think that much of it could have had commercial commercial sec success in a better world. Yes. Because there was just great stuff coming out of there. Yeah. Hey, let's wrap it up. Geza, thank you so much. Is there anything you want to say as we talk? Oh, that's great. I really appreciate you, Gabriel. I really appreciate you for letting me do this with you. And it's been fun. And I'm really honored that I get to speak with you and hear the back, the back stories. You know? And I'm really looking forward to your project that's coming out, the film. Um, would love it if it was like episode after episode after episode, because that seems to be a trending thing. But it's pretty cool. I love it. I, I love the paintings behind you. Uh, that one up on the, uh, uh, to your left behind you on the other side, up mm -hmm. above Mickey. Yeah. What is that? I'm not quite sure. It's four people posing in twisted variations. It looks like Anthony Ox gang's work, sort of. No. Close. But All right. Maybe. Catch you later, Thank buddy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Take care. Okay. And so we are now signing off. Gabriel from Punk Globe Magazine. And thank you so much for watching the video. And I want to thank Geza. I want to thank Ginger Coyote for letting me do this. Um, it was such a great opportunity, and I'm very honored. Have a great day. Hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much. And we are ending. Out. So long. Goodbye.